Welcome to the Rebel Health Coach Podcast with Tom Underwood. Armed with truth and knowledge, your journey to a healthy lifestyle can be obtained. Preventative wellness, quality nourishment, and daily fitness routines dramatically improve your outlook on life as a whole. And you'll find the support and info you need to accomplish a healthier lifestyle here. Together, we can empower each other along our journey to an amazing you. And today's episode of the Rebel Health Coach Podcast, I have James Maskell. James Maskell has spent the past decade encouraging a shift away from conventional Western medicine and toward a wellness-centered functional medicine model. To that end, he created the Functional Forum, the world's largest integrative medicine conference. He is also the author of a book called The Revolution of Medicine, which, in my opinion, is an amazing book. He is also the founder of The Evolution of Medicine, a community e-commerce platform that provides highly curated and customized resources, tools, products, and services, making it easier and more affordable for conventional doctors to embark on a new way of delivering healthcare. James lectures internationally and has been featured on TED Med, HuffPost Live, TEDx, and more. He is also a contributor to the Huffington Post, Kevin MD, the Doctor Blog, and Mind Body Green. He serves on the faculty of George Washington University's Metabolic Medicine Institute. I am excited to have this talk with James today about his most recent project, a health cooperative called New Health. That's spelled with a K, K K-E-N-W, which is poised to fight chronic disease through prevention and by using functional and integrative medicine. Enjoy this episode. James, I'd like to uh, welcome you to the Rebel Health Coach podcast today. Great to be with you, Tom. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a blessing from my end. Uh, I have to say, when I first started with the School of Applied Functional Medicine, I read, picked up your book, The Re- Evolution of Medicine. And uh, I was attending the monthly meetings at an AMEN clinic here in Atlanta to watch your functional forum on, as a group on Monday nights, or the, or the first Monday of every month, I believe. And uh, I have to give you a huge thank you for your part of bringing awareness to functional medicine. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's been a great journey so far, but we're just getting started. And I'm excited to see what this uh, next phase holds in terms of you know, the goals that have been really the same all the way along, which is the widespread adoption of functional medicine into the medical system and ideally setting up a, a structure that can control healthcare costs and keep people well. Yeah, I, it's amazing. So how, how did you get into this world of functional medicine from being an investment banker. (laughs) Yeah. The investment banker is like the one job I had after college. I got like a, you know, a, a, a job, they give you sometimes like an internship and then you get a job straight out of college. So I did that for like a year. I did the, uh, I did the, um, the exams that you have to do to be able to trade on the exchange. And then, um, about a six months into it, I kind of realized that, this was not really my calling in life and that having a calling was actually um, an important thing to chase. And I wanted to be at the bottom of a ladder that I wanted to climb. And, you know, uh, investment banking is made to look kind of cool in the movies and it's fun and exciting and look at all these things that are happening. But I can tell you from being, you know, on the coal face on the largest trading floor in the world in London uh, at HSBC, that it's not cool. Um, It's not really that fun. It's just, uh, a lot of people making money out of nothing and not really contributing in my mind to, you know, to the progression of humanity. And I was, you know, I grew up as the weird kid who did natural medicine. I had a chiropractor growing up. Not many people knew what that was. You know, my mom was the only mother in school of any of the kids in school that insisted that I be, that she be consulted before they would just, that I was given antibiotics. So my mother with no medical training, you know, 30 years before everyone else realized there was a downside of antibiotics was, was on it. And it always just struck, it stuck with me as I went through school and, you know, education and 
you know, health. I did a degree in health economics and, and that was like the focus of university. How did she know that? Like, what was, what was her education that she got that helped her to like pre, you know, predate scientific discovery? And, you know, what I realized is that there was a whole new world that I didn't really understand. And that was holism. And um, I moved in 2005. I sort of had a moment of clarity that I was playing for the wrong team. And I came to work and um, that was 2005. I, I moved to America and I, my first job was literally working in a integrated medicine practice with a naturopathic doctor. And, you know, that was the beginning of a, of a 13 year journey um, or 14 years now almost uh, to, you know, to being involved on the front lines of health creation in America. That's awesome. That's very awesome. How did the functional forum get started? Yeah, so um, I've been involved. So 2005, um, I worked in a clinic for a couple of years and that clinic just happened to be one of the best run clinics that I've ever seen. You know, they, it's, it was a spa. So, you know, the people who owned it had been in the spa industry. And so they really understood how to run uh, a practice like that. Um, <clears throat> then I was working for doctors. So I was a sales rep and I was selling to doctors uh, in the sort of in the functional medicine, integrated medicine space. So I was meeting chiropractors and naturopathic doctors and functional MDs, learning the space. Uh, in 2010, I started a practice management company. I started a website company, you know, all about helping these doctors to communicate what they did more effectively to the general public. And then in 2000, you know, I got the chance to speak then in front of doctors and, and at conferences and just realized like, it was kind of a significant barrier to entry to get doctors to come and do functional medicine. And that barrier was that the classes that you could take, you know, were kind of expensive and you had to fly across the country and there wasn't a lot of free content. And also that, you know, that there was value in community. You know, I'd been to LA where Dr. Hyla Cass had her West Side meetup where she would get 50, 100, 150 practitioners every month together and, and form a community there. You know, when I was a sales rep, I had created these kind of micro communities based around our products and services. But I just realized that, you know, every city in America needed a community of doctors that were interested in functional medicine. I had seen Ellie Campbell's one that you, you know, that you go to there in, um, in, in Atlanta. And I had spoken at that, I think in like 2011 about practice management. And so, you know, I just saw that, you know, we could do this in New York. So we started the Functional Forum. I had some ideas about, you know, how to make it interesting. We had been doing events for practitioners for five or six years. So things that we had learned along the way, we put into the show, but we tried to make it fun. And obviously it was free online. We tried to put doctors who were, um, you know, aspirational characters like Kelly Brogan and Jeff Glad and Shilpa Saxena, you know, doctors that other doctors would see and be like, oh, I want to be like them. And, um, and so that was, you know, that was the beginning of it. So we, we started, the first episode was in February, 2014. And yeah, it was just, it been a great journey to be able to try and make it easier for doctors, one, to find out about functional medicine, two, to actually, you know, go through and get the training, but then most importantly, to actually start to practice it and be doing it every day. And it's been a it's been a great journey to you know learn the ins and outs of that business. Okay, in your book, The Evolution of Medicine, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, you cover a lot of issues with the current healthcare model. You also talk about a vision for the future. How do you think we're doing so far, going moving towards that better healthcare system? Yeah, it's you know there, there's a lot of progress. You know, the book came out two years ago, so I mean, if you look at the last four years, the functional forum has been going almost five years. So we started in January 2014, February 2014. So in the last five years, you know, you have the Cleveland Clinic project that was announced on the fourth episode of the functional forum and is now like a real thing. Right. We've took the cameras around it. The 59th episode of the forum, we actually go around the Cleveland Clinic and and show what they're actually doing there. It's exciting. You know, you have, I just did this tour around the country and I met hundreds and hundreds of doctors that, you know, whose lives and practices and outlook on healthcare has been transformed by either, you know, the functional forums or the Evolution of Medicine Summit or the podcast or, or even just coming to the meetups, you know, and, and learning through that. So, you know, it was great to see 
now that there is a functional medicine clinic in pretty much every small town, definitely every city, pretty much every small town has someone practicing functional medicine or some variation of functional medicine. So, you know, I think the micro practice, the, re the reason why we came up with the micro practice revolution as the concept was because it was actionable. It's like a doctor could just start their own practice. You know, at the same time in the last five years, you've seen big integrated medicine centers closed, you know, in Minnesota, right. New York, and in Arizona. So, you know, so I think on the on the, the evolution of medicine, the concept was that there was very few barriers to entry to a doctor to actually start their own local, small, functional micro practice. And I think we have seen that. I think on the biggest scheme, you know, we see progress with the Institute for Functional Medicine, you know, starting programs now around the world. And, the, you know, there's certainly progress on that end. The Cleveland Clinic is an exciting project. There's more hospitals that are sort of becoming Cleveland Clinic-ish, you know, with, with pilot programs, which is kind of exciting. So I think, you know, I think it's, it's progress. I'm, I'm just a guy who happens to be uh, not always happy with the speed of things. I get a little impatient. And so, you know, New Health and some of their other initiatives are really to try and speed the whole thing along. Right, right. Before we go into New Health, uh, I want to talk about the cost of uh, healthcare and people's perception of the cost of functional medicine is that it's expensive. How can functional medicine actually bring down that cost of healthcare? Yeah, so it's a good question. So, you know, functional medicine appears expensive because people have to pay for it outside of their plan. If it was included in their health plan, it wouldn't appear expensive. You know, if you have to pay for everything cash out of pocket and you already have a health plan that you, you know, that you have, that can appear expensive. So the first thing is, is I just want everyone to, to understand that, right? The, 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 there's a sort of an illusion of expense that's created by having to pay the patient, you know, the, the patient directly, uh, pay the doctor directly. Now that's in, you know, in the context, when you say it's expensive, you also have to look at the, you know, what's in context of and the price of healthcare generally has gone up, you know, significantly over the last 40 years. I mean, ridiculously exponentially, you might say, um, you know, with, with, uh, you know, the, the premiums and then obviously the deductibles have been going on, you know, way up $10,000 per person uh, in America, $3.2 trillion, you know, drugs are expensive, that kind of thing. I mean, ultimately, the way that functional medicine, so there's two things. So functional medicine has to become more efficient and, and delivered in a more efficient, accessible, predictable way. And we can talk about that. And then functional medicine, you know, needs to... That's, so that's the first. Let's talk about how we do that first. Okay. I mean, ultimately, I've been teaching practitioners this for the last couple of years. And then, you know, we, we've we taken this to heart with, with New Health, which is we need to find ways to, you know, to bring down the cost of functional medicine. There's a few ways. One is using structures that are more efficient. So in the first year of functional medicine, it was all about just the doctor. The doctor would learn it and the doctor would spend the time. But now you see doctor-health coach combinations, right? Where the coach is doing most of the coaching at a much lower month, a month, much lower hourly rate. And the doctor is really just there for the diagnosis. Frank Lippman was really at the beginning of this. Parsley Health has sort of, you know, looked at that and you see that growing. So most, you know, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so a lot of functional medicine doctors are hiring health coaches to do the heavy lifting on the lifestyle change because doctors are really, you know, too highly paid to be telling you not to eat gluten or to be like coming up with a meal plan for you. So that's one thing. The group structures is another one. So, you know, how do you give people access to the functional medicine operating system? Not a full detailed deep dive consult, but just access to, you know, prioritizing uh, different functional improvements in the body. There's some really innovative work happening in group visits. So, you know, they're doing group visits to the Cleveland Clinic. We have doctors in our practice accelerator who have innovated on group structures and created ways to be able to use a group as sort of like an intaking process. So everyone comes through this group intaking process. And then if you want to go deeper into an, uh, a one-on-one -on -one appointment, you can, but everyone gets sort of like the overall deep dive diagnostics that they participate in themselves. So that's, you know, that's another way, the use of technology, I think, uh, to be able to 
do things like telemedicine and and you know uh, you know email connection those kind of things. So there, there are things that are happening to make the delivery of functional medicine more efficient. And in many cases, those efficiencies can be turned into reduction in price for the end user for the patient. But you know, obviously, again, as long as we're still paying outside of our health plans, then you know, then then it's still going to look expensive. Even something like Parsley Health, which is $150 a month and has done a great job in sort of bringing down the cost of functional medicine, you know, in a certain way, there's only a certain group of people in society that will ever be able to afford that sort of payment on top of the health plan. And so, you know, the real work to make functional medicine accessible and available to everyone is to find ways to have it be part of their, of people's health plans or to have a transformation in the kind of health plans that people get so that they can choose the kind of health care that they want. So that's, you know, that's the, the next phase. And that's what we're, you know, sort of deeply involved with at this point. But I think that, you know, overall, the concepts of functional medicine, root cause resolution, the patient provider relationship, and looking at the body as a whole, like those concepts are ready for prime time in medicine and are, are sort of a solution to a lot of different uh, problems. But we need to find ways to be able to deliver that, that promise in a sort of a scalable way. Otherwise, it will only ever be for, you know, for, you know, for rich people. You know, if the, the other thing that could happen, Tom, is that if functional medicine is able to show categorically like better outcomes at lower cost for a range of diseases, that would be the first step towards, you know, major acceptance where now, you know, health plans could start paying for functional medicine. I just feel like that might be five or 10 years away mm -hmm. still. And that's why, you know, again, that's why we see new health as such a critical component because it opens up more wallet share for your general, your average consumer to be able to invest in the care that they believe. Right, right. Yeah, I agree 100%. Now, let's, you've been a very busy man traveling the country with a new health tour, which I believe just wrapped up in Los Angeles on what, the 1st of November, correct? That's right, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I love a quote from you where it says, together we can disrupt the current healthcare model, shifting the paradigm away from over-dependency on the allopathic disease-centered model to create a more sustainable and preventable system. Can you expand on this a little bit before we dive into the new health model? Yeah, I mean, I just feel like, you know, here's, here's a situation where most other people who have some other plan for how healthcare could be solved are sort of thinking that there needs to be some other, you know, regulation or, or law change or otherwise where, oh, now we're going to have single payer or we're going to, you know, these, these kind of ideas. And, and, you know, what we, what we set out with the tour is just to really communicate to our community and, and, and shortly to many other communities that have these kind of ideas together is that, all the laws that need to change in order for the widespread adoption of functional medicine to happen have already happened. Um, and that's, you know, with new health, the, you know, with, with what we're doing and, and you know, with, uh, with the project is that if, if 10 million people across, let's say, the following communities, if, if the majority of the following communities all just suddenly decided that they were going to support new health, so let's say the paleo diet community, the health coach community, the functional medicine community, the nurse community, the, um, you know, libertarian community, you know, if all of those groups just suddenly decide, okay, we're all going to sign up for new health, all the ones that are, you know, that, that are uh, independently employed, you know, you would have a situation where one, the, the business, you know, you, you would have a situation where, where this could influence significantly the way that healthcare is delivered across the country because, because there would be, you know, a shift in one, a lot of people leaving their current health plans to come into this health plan. And now you have, a, you know, an opportunity with 10,000 people or 10 million people, whatever those numbers are, to be able to show that this works, right? To be able to show that uh, functional medicine, you know, saves money and controls costs in the medium term by, you know, by keeping people well. And so that's kind of our, you know, our goal. And, you know, that's, we, we, we believe that, 
the you know the the use of medication as the first line therapy for chronic illness is like a is in in a lot of cases a, a failed strategy where it's just led to worse outcomes you know worse cost outcomes for sure and in a lot of cases worse clinical outcomes and definitely an escalation of cost and ultimately that by putting you know a non prescriber i.e. a health coach at the front of medicine and getting everyone to connect with a health coach gives us the best chance of being able to you know reverse the tide on chronic illness i think you know behavior change is definitely um, not easy but i think the bright sparks of behavior change come with real real interactions between real people and that could be in a group format like a group visit it could be in a coaching format it could be in a community format i mean we have to really look at the places in the world that have the lowest incidence of chronic illness like the blue zones and be like well what can we learn from them do they have epic medical facilities no do they have epic functional medicine facilities no but they have a culture and they have a community that reinforces that culture and they have you know the support network that facilitates an environment where health is easy and is the norm and you know i think that any group of people whether it be 10,000 to 10 million if they came together with that intention could showcase that that it's not you know changing health outcomes is not necessarily about changing the health system it's about changing the healthy behaviors and that happens in a community setting and it's it comes when there's a new kind of a culture and that's reinforced by community structures and that's the goal of what we want to create in new health and you know ultimately it's it's a community structure it's not a business in in the same kind of way it's a you know health cost sharing has a lot of you know uh, synergy with functional medicine because it's a community structure and it's it it gives everyone sort of more of an ownership not just of their own health ownership of your own health like there's no situation in the future of medicine that saves money and, and controls healthcare costs where people are not in control of their health generally like they have to be empowered to be part of it and this structure you know facilitates that right right now let's move into the new health model uh, putting the care back into healthcare for the listeners who are not familiar with new health which i'm sure they will be eventually and they're moving towards this but what is new health and the vision i know community is one of your five c's which you just spoke about community yeah. Well, yeah, the vision is to be able to create a new community uh, of individuals that may come from different backgrounds, but you know have learned something along the way already. Which is that health doesn't come from a pill. Health doesn't come from you know. Health comes from the actualization of healthy behaviors. You know, ongoing, and that that's where you. That's how you avoid chronic illness. That's how you control healthcare costs. That's how you you know, stay well, and that ultimately the medical system is there when that breaks down, but that ultimately that breakdown medical system is never going to be effective at keeping you well because it's not designed for that. So, you know, really it's about creating the structures that keep people well from scratch because, you know, the structures that exist right now are not adaptable. Like if you look at, if you go back to the, the evolution of medicine, the, the name or the thesis you know, we realize that it's very difficult to get a system that's been built on, you know, disease, you know, on, on acute disease to suddenly be a chronic disease reversal and prevention. They're not built for the same thing. And so the vision of New Health is really to be able to showcase how a community can work together to establish a healthy culture backed up by community and health coaching to be able to keep as many people as possible out of the disease management system, which is you know what is responsible for the vast majority of costs, eighty six percent of healthcare costs. And you know we've you know I've been interested for thirteen years in how do you make this kind of care the standard of care, and you and the way to do that is to have it be included in the health plan. That people buy. And so, you know, New Health was founded on a, a desire to do that. The opportunity for New Health to actually become what it is today, which is, you know, sort of um, something that you, that is a sort of like an equivalent to health insurance and in that, you know, that you buy it to take care of your downside risk of something happening. But it's built on a model called health cost sharing or medical cost sharing. 
And medical cost sharing is a sort of a uniquely American intervention. Um, for the last 30 years, it has existed and has been very successful. More than a million Americans use it to um, take care of their downside risk of, uh, of you know, health issues. But it's, it's similar to insurance in that you pay in a certain amount every month and that there's a certain amount that you have to, it has to be paid by you before uh, the coverage, which is an insurance word, or the sharing, which is a health sharing word, kicks in. But ultimately, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a completely realized health plan. And in our completely realized health plan, everyone gets a health coach. Everyone is educated about functional medicine and everyone sort of agrees to be part of a community that is going to support each other in creating their own best health. So, you know, New Health started uh, with, the, you know, the vision of, of creating structures that could, you know, control costs and keep people healthy. And we see that the best way to do that is to be part of a health plan. And so when the opportunity came up as a result of the Trump tax bill, to create our own medical cost sharing program and not just be, you know, uh, that there were historically there'd be five that were, that were sort of um, supported by the ACA uh, that were given an exemption to the, to the law. And so ours is the first non, non, it's not that it's non Christian, it's non denominational. So you can be Christian, you can be Jewish, you can be an atheist, as long as you are, you know, interested in health and wellness and, and participate in a healthy lifestyle you can be part of the new community. And now for some general housekeeping. First things first, if you enjoyed this episode, please take a minute, go into your app and rate and review this show. Then share it with your friends. This would mean the world to me. Next up, to join my mailing list for newsletters and other emails, text RHCP. Rebel Health Coach Podcast, RHCP to 22828. Again, text RHCP to 22828. I promise not to send you endless emails. Believe me, who has the time for that? Now, to grab a free 20-minute consultation with me, go to my website and on the homepage... At the bottom is a red button that says book now. Click it and schedule your consultation with me. I will have you fill out an intake form so that during our consultation, we can discuss what I can do for you and also see if we are a good fit to work together. You can find the link in the show notes also. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the episode. I am currently a member of Liberty Health Share and have been for the last three years. So I'm familiar with Liberty Health Share and how it works and the sharing system. But can you expand on that a little bit for people who aren't familiar with the, the health sharing concept? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so the, the health the health sharing concept is based on a voluntary uh, mutual support of funds. And it sort of, you know, started in Christian groups and they were sort of like, Hey, if we've got a, if we've got a, if we've got 10,000 people in our church, we don't necessarily need insurance. We don't need 10,000 insurance policies to take care of our 10,000 people in the church because, you know, the church could just take care of it. There's, you know, you can take care of the downside risk of some accident happening either by buying an insurance policy or being part of a community that agrees that if you know you get in a car accident and you need money to pay for your healthcare we'll chip in so that's kind of how it started in its very earliest days is you know a church group let's say they have 10,000 people some health need for someone in the community comes up it costs $10,000 everyone chips in a dollar that's pretty much sort of how it started. And literally at the beginning in the 80s, it was people mailing checks to each other. Then it grew because it was cheaper than insurance. And you start to see in the 80s, there wasn't really a need for health cost sharing before the 80s because medical costs were not that high, right? It didn't take up such a huge percentage of it wallet shares it does today. So then in the 80s, you get the beginning of managed care. 
And through the 90s, you see the health, the cost of healthcare go up significantly. And so these health shares become much more popular because people are saving a lot of money over insurance. And so, you know, these things grew. So by 2009, there's 160,000 Americans using medical cost sharing. And then a big thing happens in 2009 where these five groups that do medical cost sharing get an exemption to the Affordable Care Act. So now, you know, the Affordable Care Act comes in, there's now a tax penalty for not having health insurance. But if you're one of these Christian groups, you know, you can avoid the tax penalty. And so in the, in the nine years since that law comes in, those numbers grow very, very rapidly. And you get like, as of January 2018, a million people doing these cost sharing. So the, the question is, why are they? It's, why is it so much cheaper? Because essentially the same thing is happening, right? People, if people get hit by a car, they still get the same care, probably in the same hospital. But how does the maths work out at the back end that it's more expensive, that it's way less expensive? And for anyone who's listening, who's been involved in the medical system in any way in America, one of the things you know is that there's a range of prices for any service. Right, so lab testing is the most obvious and egregious example in my mind. In that, if you go into your doctor's office, and many of your listeners have probably had this exact experience, you go into the doctor's office, give your insurance card, you know, you pay your copay, and then the doctor says you need these tests, and you say, okay, well, look, I've got insurance, so bill me for the, you know, let's do these tests. So you do the tests, and then you see the bill, and you realize, like, you know, this is a very expensive lab panel. Let's say one example, like a homocysteine test going through insurance, $737. Now, you have to pay that whole amount because you haven't met your deductible. Most Americans have a high deductible plan. So you're paying the first $3,000, $4,000, $5,000, $10,000 of your care anyway, right? So let's just say for a moment now, you get the homocysteine test, you get billed $737 for that one test. But if you live in California, like I do, or if you live in 47 other states in the nation where you, you don't need to go to, you know, through the doctor for the labs, you can go directly, that same test could be like 20 bucks. So you know, that range in pricing in any other country at any other time, this is just a scam, right? This is just right. some sort of like scam where people are charging a ridiculously high price for something that costs a lot less. In any other industry, this would be outed as a scam and no one would use it. And it would just be like, you know, sort of a relic. But this thing stays around because the system is so set up and people are, it's designed to be opaque and no one really knows what's going on. So in medical cost sharing, the same kind of things are happening in terms of like care is being delivered, you know, different things are happening. Um, but no one ever pays the full price because everyone in the community identifies as a cash pay patient. They pay the cash rates to the provider. If you're going to a doctor, you know, you just pay the cash rates there and then you submit for reimbursement. Anything more than a doctor, you can call up New Health um, and you can say, hey, you know, I've got to have an MRI. You know, where can I have it? And, you know, they, we have the, the partners that we partner with have been doing this for 30 years. They have an incredible database in every zip code around the country of where value is in the health system. And so ultimately, the difference between medical cost sharing and insurance, in insurance, you're essentially buying um, peace of mind from a company to say, okay, if, if such and such happens, they guarantee that these guys will pay for my care. And in medical cost sharing, you're joining a community where the same agreements exist, but ultimately the price of what is paid out for those things is much lower because everyone's identifying as a cash patient. In the example I just gave you, $737 versus $20 for a lab test, so that's saving 98%, you know, because you're paying, you know, such a low rate. But that same kind of thing is possible in, I was just reading today about air ambulances. Who knew? But there's been a massive growth in air ambulances in America. Sometimes it costs thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 to take an air ambulance. Private companies getting involved. What do they say in the article? Guess who always pays the least or closest to market for air ambulance? A cash pay self-pay patient because they don't have insurance. And so you just pay a normal rate and then you would submit for reimbursement. So the reason I say all this is that, that there's similar concepts in that you're, you're taking care of your downside risk of having an emergency and then you have some care that's included in the plan. But ultimately, you're looking at a significant savings. So far, when people have used the cost calculator at newhealth.com, 
We've seen on average for couples, it's been around $5,000 a year for families, $6,500 a year. And just for average people, $2,500 um, $2, per person per year. So the savings are, are pretty dramatic. And what we see for people who care about their own health and wellness is that they're able to buy a plan like this to take care of their downside risk and then use some of the money that they're saving to invest in the wellness services that they value. Could be chiropractic, could be acupuncture, could be massage, could be, you know, having more doctor's visits because you value that, you know, you know, having more checkups. But ultimately, you know, we're just in a position to be able to give people um, a structure where if they have their own ideas about what's best for their health, that they can actualize those own ideas. And that's a lot of the functional medicine community. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I, like I said, I've been a member of Liberty Health Share. When I go to the physician, it's a cash pay basis. And I think my I go once a year for an annual physical. And I think it cost me $500 cash pay for lab work and the appointment. Whereas with insurance, it was probably $3,000. Yeah. Or more. So that's it. Like, so once you understand the scam, then you do it. And, you right. know, and ultimately, here's the thing is like, we may, you know, we may end up in a recession in the next two years. Like, that's pretty cyclical. Every 10 years, there's a recession. Right. If that were to happen, you know, how many fewer people end up getting functional medicine because it's this extra expense that they can't afford on top of their health plan. What we see is that if we have now a product that's cheaper, the number of people who will leave health insurance to look for other plans is going to be much greater than the number of people who just don't spend any money. And so this is like a hedge for us because we see that we have to get more people into this operating system of care. You know, we if we want to control healthcare costs in the future. And so we just saw this opportunity as a way to be able to make it easy for people and especially young people and families to be able to say, okay, I want to I want to invest in a health plan that gives me peace of mind in case something terrible happens, but that also empowers me to stay healthy and avoid medication and avoid the medical system altogether. Right. I mean, I, I think when I ran my numbers, I'm going to give you a, a, for new health, my payment was like 252 a month. If I was to go with blue or a normal insurance company, even the, even the least expensive one was almost 1200 to $1,300 a month. Is that for an individual? Or that was family? just me, 59 yeah. years old. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, look, that's it. So, you know, that's, you know, that's it. You, we, we see that there's the opportunity there. Now, if you were to get into a car accident, you know, the difference or, you know, let's say you break your arm, classic example, you know, if you were to break your arm and you go into the right hospital, they're going to bill your insurance a hundred grand for the whole thing. And you're going to have to pay your deductible three grand and then the, you know, the insurance is going to cover 97 grand. In our system, you know, you identify as a cash player, you pay seven grand, you submit for insurance reimbursement. And now it's, you know, and now you pay your number, it could be, you know, 500 or five, you know, 500, 1500, 5000. But ultimately, you can see that no one, no one's ever paying the 100 right. grand. Right, no one's paying that ninety-three thousand dollars that's just going into the system, and you know, paying the paychecks of all the middle managers of all the you know cost organizations and the you know and the insurance companies. We have to find some sort of way of controlling costs, right. and medical cost sharing has been better at controlling costs than you know even Medicare. Medicare Medicare can't even negotiate drug prices, and that's that's serving like a hundred million people because the grips of the health insurance and pharma and, and, you know, they just have their grips on the system. Mm. The medical cost sharing is this sort of like glitch in the matrix is the way that I'd like to think of it <laughs> where, you know, where all things are possible and you can build something from scratch. And so, you know, when Trump, you know, uh, created this structure where now competition came a little bit back into these markets, you know, that we just saw the opportunity to try and build something that right. could facilitate it. I'm going to put a link in the show notes for New Health, and I, I really suggest that you, you know, the listeners go click on it and, and look for themselves, the savings. It's incredible. Now, let me ask you a question, though. If somebody has insurance already, can they switch over? Yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, 
there's typically there, there are people who new health is not a fit for uh, at okay. this moment in our first one so let me just show you that so first of all we can't take any people over 65 you know the partner that we've built with they've been doing this medical cost sharing for 65 when you get to 65 and you're an american citizen you're automatically enrolled in medicare and being part of medicare is actually problematic for you know, for the medical cost sharing business. So I want to over 65, it's not really a fit for. And if you have, you know, if you have significant health insurance through your company, then that's, that's probably it. I mean, we've had a lot of questions so far, Tom, where people say, well, look, I've got a family of four and I'm only paying $200 for health insurance. Right. And what they don't realize is that they're paying $200, but their company is paying the other 1800 Right. And so they think they're paying 200. They're actually paying 2000. It's just that their company's covering most of it. And so, you know, so if you, so if you're on a, if you're in that kind of plan, now what we have heard, which is amazing, I heard from a psychologist the other day who said, Hey, I'm going to quit my job because I've only ever had this job for the health benefits. And, you know, I was so scared of going onto Cobra or having to pay for my own health insurance because I saw how much it was going to cost. It was going to be like $3,000 for me and my family. So a month. So that's why I kept my job. But now I see that I can get it for $500 through you guys. I'm going to quit my job and do what I can, you know, go into private practice rather than working at the hospital. So that was super exciting because now we see, okay, now people are going to be able to sort of break free of the system and, and do that. So the, the groups that is not really a fit for are the self, you know, the, the people who are employed by big companies who get their health plan through their company where it's heavily subsidized. Two is Medicare people. And then three, if you make so little money that your health insurance is subsidized by the state, then I can't really compete with that either. Right. Uh, you know, we are aiming for sort of like the middle, which is self-employed people. And obviously, like, if you think about health coaches or people who work in functional medicine, you're typically working in a small business environment. If you have less than 50 employees, you can sign up for new health. So, you know, we've seen whole functional medicine practices signing up. Um, we've seen tons of independently employed health professionals like health coaches, chiropractors, naturopathic doctors, acupuncturists, nurses all signing up. And um, it's been exciting. And, and next year, we're going to connect uh, the product to millions of people through a range of you know, celebrities and ambassadors who all have communities that are sick and tired of the sick care system. And as I said, that could be, you know, people who have got well with certain diets like paleo or vegan. It could be like health professionals themselves who don't like paying for health insurance or they, they don't like having a prepaid drug plan, which is essentially what health insurance today is. But then there's also groups like, you know, libertarians who, you know, want to be able to just do their own thing. And so they love this idea too. So, you know, so we've got a, a good group of people that all have the similar interests and we hope that in the next two years, uh, we can grow this thing significantly and uh, start to have a, an impact on health outcomes at a population level. All right. A couple quick questions before we wind this up, but being a functionally medicine trained health coach, I have to ask this because where do we fit in your model? Right at the front end. I mean, we're hiring those those doctors, I mean, sorry, those coaches, we're hiring to, you know, for everyone to get it. Our first version of New Health, you know, you have only a couple of sessions. It's really just to like, you know, to, to get you moving on the right path. You know, we will in version two have more thorough coaching. So where you can meet with your coach ongoing, you can have text access to them. You know, these are some of the things that we did in version one of New Health that we'll, we'll be rolling out. But yeah, I mean, we believe that the functional medicine trained health coach is dollar for dollar, the most valuable um, person in the health system. If you can facilitate behavior change, if you can get patients to you know, to eat differently, to exercise differently, to sleep differently, to ex you know, to um, relax differently, meditate, you know, the health savings of that are significant. And so, you know, we, we're putting them right at the front. So we'll be hiring. Uh, we've already hired some. We'll be hiring a lot more depending on how many members sign up. If we sign up tens of thousands of members, we'll be hiring hundreds, if not thousands of health coaches. So I hope that answers your question. That's, that definitely answers my question. Does New Health plan to expand outside of the United States eventually? Yeah, we do, definitely. But the services that we provide in other markets will depend on the health system as it is right now. Okay. So like in the UK, it's a it's a issue that's close to my heart because I grew up there and my mom lives there. You know, I think in the UK, 
the cost sharing element will probably not be as obvious, but in the UK, we would hope to be able to get an NHS contract to be able to work with, you know, a certain range of diseases. So let's say they know that they've got 10,000 patients with Crohn's that are costing them a hundred million dollars a year or a hundred million pounds a year. You know, we would work with those people for 70 million uh, or something like that, right? So that we would bet on ourselves to be able to get people well through the use of functional medicine with health coaches and doctors and low-cost labs all working together. You know, uh, another example is Egypt. And, and this is kind of an example that I want to give because this is really where I think this is where the most transformational stuff can happen. Egypt has a 15% insured rate. So in Egypt, you have 85% of a 90 million population that are uninsured. So, you know, imagine putting 50 million Egyptians into a medical cost sharing program where everyone gets a health coach. Now you have one, some sort of like safety net for all those people who at this moment, if one of their family breaks an arm or gets hit by a car, they have to get as much money from their friends and family as quickly as possible to pay for their bill. Otherwise they're out on the street. So there's no, there's no, you know, socialized care. There's nothing. Uh, for them, there's just inpatient facilities, hospitals. There's no outpatient care at all. There's no telemedicine. There's no health coaching. There's nothing wow. like that. So, you know, so that's really exciting. And, and you know, worldwide, there's billions and billions of people who are uninsured mm. and live in, a, in an unsophisticated medical economy where they're just one accident away from, a, you know, a drastic life change. So that's where I think it's exciting. So, you know, the, the, the functional medicine piece, the efficient delivery of functional medicine piece will be a fit in some countries. The medical cost sharing will be a fit in others. But I think the demand for care that reverses chronic illness will be, you know, unlimited. Awesome. All right. This is a fun question. Okay. Okay. If James Maskell has an hour to relax and chill or half an hour, what would you put on to listen to as far as uh, album or artist? Yeah, so that's a good question. I've uh, over time, I like I hate commercials. I'll do almost anything to avoid commercials. So you know, I have Apple Music, um, but recently I've been listening to a lot of SoundCloud, which is like a um, a service that where so I, I like listening to um, DJ mixes where they don't have where there's no words. Okay. I find it, you know, relaxing. So there's a DJ that I like called Lemurian, L-E-M-U-R-I-A-N. Uh, he's amazing and he has a bunch of mixes on SoundCloud and I'll listen to something like that. Um, this last weekend, I was having family time. So we were doing some puzzles and board games and cards and all those kind of things. But I like to listen to music when I'm working. I just find that if there's a lot of lyrics, it's not very good for me to be productive. I need it to be like... Um, I like having music in the background. I used to do, listen to a lot of like classical music while I was working, um, but now I found like extended DJ mixes where there's no ads and where I can um, where there's a there's a constant music, but it's not interfering with my thinking process. Is what I like. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, James, for joining me today. I appreciate it, and I'm very grateful for you to take this time. I know you're a busy man. No, it's all right, Tom. Keep spreading the good word and great to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you for joining in today with the Rebel Health Coach, Tom Underwood. And be sure to subscribe to the show so you can catch all the episodes. With desire and commitment, you can implement a lifestyle of wellness and fitness. For the support, encouragement, and tools you need to be successful, visit TomUnderwood.net.